I'm like getting audio. I'm not getting any audio, Joseph. Oh, there we go. All right. Hi. Hello. Thanks for joining <laughs> us on this week's episode of um, Wise Content Creates Well. You've heard that content is king. Well, wise content rules the world. This podcast is about understanding how you can make and utilize wise content to improve your company's bottom line and your personal financial success. I am Joseph Franklin McElroy, and I'm a marketing technology expert who has built a multi-million dollar company. I'm also an award-winning content producer. Be sure to go to my website for this podcast, uh, wisecontentcreateswealth.com, to sign up for my newsletter and to get access to resources to help you produce wise content. My company is Galileo Tech Media, a leader in SEO and inbound marketing, and we're specialists in wise content. This is content that incorporates semantic science, behavioral science, AI, and data to make marketing content that is smart and that performs better. On our agenda today is content, SEO, and technology. Did you know that Benjamin Franklin was probably considered one of the first uh, people to use content marketing? He actually published the yearly Poor Richard's Almanac with the goal of promoting his business, his printing business, and that was in 1732. Uh, in 1801, the bookstore library Galaginani employed creative content strategies to grow its business including opening a, a reading room and a printing a newspaper that feature articles from influential authors and books. So it's been going on a long time. Lots of stellar entrepreneurs and leaders of our country have done it. Now I'm going to introduce you to a leader uh, today. His name is Kevin Lee. He's the uh, executive chairman and co-founder uh, and a marketing mad scientist of his company, Did It. <laughs> Uh, he co-founded that company in 1996, and he's also been the chair of the CENFO, which is the Search Engine Marketing Professionals Organization, uh, and, uh, and several other organizations with that uh, neck. He's, uh, he invents technology solutions to marketing problems for clients, and he builds lots of platforms. Um, so he's always innovating, and he's, over, he's the author of over 750 columns on marketing, uh, and published across many of publications. He's a prolific speaker at over 550 conferences and events over 24 years. Uh, and he is, uh, comes from a pedig pedigree of, uh, with an MBA at Yale and, uh, and uh, I think in multiple A's and he lives up in Scarsdale. How are you doing, Kevin? Very well, thanks, uh, Joseph, for having me on the show. I'm glad you could make it. Uh, we've known each other for a little while. It's good to have an opportunity to collaborate on something. Um, so your background uh, coming into the workforce was in business and economics with an advanced degree from Yale. And then you went immediately into advertising and sales for McCann and Erickson. So how did you evolve to become a marketing technology leader today? Well, you know, uh, when, I, when I have a passion for advertising and marketing. Um, and when I was at McCann Erickson, I was probably one of the more geeky account executives there. And so anytime anything had to do with technology, I'd end up having to do it for them. So this sort of intersection of technology and advertising at the time was really not very much of an intersection in 1990, uh, 1992. Um, and uh, around 1994, that was when digital really first started to take off with uh, AOL and CompuServe. And so I, I had this sort of epiphany then that like it was really going to be digital advertising that I liked the most. And um, so I, I ended up joining up with somebody to start an agency in 94 and did it was a spinoff of that in 1996 uh, with an SEO monitoring tool called the Did It Detective. And uh, after that, we've invented a whole bunch of different technology and gone through a lot of transformations over the years, uh, acquired 11 other companies, uh, mostly small ones. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, who I am and what I do. <laughs> <laughs> so was did it, did it Detective your first foray into technology? It was. Uh, you know, the, 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 the Detective was, was uh, designed to let you know 
whether your uh, URL was live in about a dozen search engines. So AltaVista, InfoSeq, Lycos, you know, this is all pre-Google. Uh -huh. And um, so people could, you know, would, would manually monitor that. And there was a competitor called Submit It. And um, so, you know, my current business partner did it, asked me at a, at a meeting, hey, you know, like what happens if, if you're, you fall out of the search engines, you know, how do you know that you're still there? Because this submitted search engine submission service, it just go ahead and puts you in there. And then you have no idea if it worked or not. He said, would it be possible to monitor it and provide a monitoring service, not just a submission service? And I said, yeah, we could, we could complete, we could totally build that. So he said, but well, why don't we do that as a joint venture? And so we got into that business and built the Did It Detective. And that was our first, that was our first foray into uh, Did It as a spinoff of this, this other uh, agency that I had been running at the time. Did you roll up your sleeves and get involved or do you have, did you have a team? Oh, I mean, I am not a coder. I'm okay. just, I, I can, uh, I'm just dangerous around code. I tend to break it if I touch it. I'm not a com classically trained computer scientist, but I speak code well enough that I can guide a product team, right? So I can guide the coders. And sometimes I can guide them away from making the wrong mistakes, uh, you know, around database structures and types of databases and, you know, ways of, of utilizing HTML better. So, you know, given the fact that we were sort of, we went from being an SEO technology to being an SEO services company, you know, you, you, it's good to be geeky. I'll put it that way. <laughs> did um, did um, understanding the, the, the language of technology help you um, be a better advertiser and marketer? I think it did because um, the, the the vehicle that 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 delivered the content was tech, right? And this this came from you know one of our early projects, which was a floppy disk based promo uh, presentation for the movie Disclosure with Demi Moore and Michael Douglas. Oh, so wow. we, you know, this, this is like way back, right? So understanding the technology and where the limits of the technology were and yet figuring out how to stretch that technology to its limit and do the coolest thing you could with it, right? That was the key. I mean, we got the Budweiser Frog screensaver outsourced to us we built the screensaver that when you're, it had audio in it. So when your screensaver would kick in on a Windows machine uh, around the time of the Budweiser frogs, your computer would start to say, ribbit, ribbit, you know, <laughs> you know and uh, the, uh, you know, th that kind of stuff, you know, sort of pushing the envelope a little bit and you know, taking what maybe other agencies had come up with because, you know, search marketing agencies typically weren't the agency of record. So you'd end up getting brought in um, to do all sorts of things and take take existing ideas and and layer onto them. So yeah, absolutely, you got it. Yeah, you have to be a geek. Uh, yeah. Now maybe less so, but certainly back then you have to be pretty. Nice. Oh, that, I think I think you know I came, I came out of the technology. I was a coder, and uh, you know uh, I had to learn the language of marketing, <laughs> which was a different path. Yeah, but uh, definitely my knowledge of technology helped me a lot in uh, in the, my endeavors. So. Uh, I, uh, I can see where that was probably an important part of where, why you are today is making that, making that important transition, I think. Um, so now you are also known as a content marketing guru. So I imagine that came out of your SEO? Yeah, to a great extent. Uh, it was a combination of things. Obviously, as you mentioned, uh, content has always been king and uh, wise content is even better. Um, and so it's sort of table stakes, right? For SEO is great content. Um, bad content can actually get you in trouble from an SEO perspective. It certainly didn't work very well for demand media uh, when they became a content farm and it came back and, and, and you know, Google didn't like that very much. Um, but, you know, great content is, is absolutely critical. Um, you know, where we sort of made that jump from just straight SEO into being very content centric was, was really this continued momentum around uh, social media. Uh, they continue to momentum around uh, owning your own content and sort of having not just earned media, but owned media, right? Whether that was on blogs or on your sites or on your, within your social media channels, you needed to be great at content. And uh, as a result, you know, you also need to be great at storytelling, right? And being a geek and being a marketer isn't good enough. And that's why we bought three PR agencies, right? PR agencies are great at storytelling. 
Right. Um, now, the old PR agencies we bought, they weren't good at digital distribution of storytelling assets, uh, but they knew how to storytell and knew how to be strategic. And, uh, and we had to also change their frame of reference, right? The other thing that, that PR agencies still think about PR hits as a particular slice of time, right? SEOs don't think about it that way. SEOs think about it like this might be a permanent link to my domain. It's going to mm -hmm. be there forever. That's super valuable. Or they think about it from the perspective of, hey, if that place that we got that PR hit has good domain authority, to use a word that nobody likes to use anymore, but uh, they, might out, they might outrank that, that same piece of content on our blog, right? So we may end up with a permanent fixture in a Google SERP or a Bing SERP as a result of getting, getting a PR hit, right? Which is much more of a long-term philosophy than straight PR. So but by sort of weaving all that stuff together, we were like, okay, content is, it's not create it once, use it once and congratulate yourself and walk away. It's really much more, how do we continue to repurpose this content? How does it sit, sit within social? How does it sit within, within your own domain? How does it sit on other domains? You know, where should content live? Should it live exclusively on your domain? Should it be syndicated out? How should you co-create content? Who should you co-create the content with? You know, when do you decide this content sucks and you would actually prefer for it to disappear, right? All that stuff added a completely new layer to our business. I mean, I think that's important. I love your emphasis on storytelling. You know, uh, one of the things I did is, uh, to, you know, I, I have a, a different sort of model and I needed lots of really good travel writers. Uh, and, or, and I knew a lot of SEO writers, but they weren't particularly good at writing about stories about travel. And even some of the travel writers weren't great at writing stories. I actually went and found Hollywood screenwriters who needed extra work and trained them on how to do SEO. And that really was a great success because they could they could tell the story, right? And everybody really wanted a good story. So it's a, it's a, it's a, I think that wise content, it's important to, uh, to embed that story right in from the beginning of what you're gonna tell. So um, I think that was a good point. Uh, yeah, I, I, one other point I'd add to that is, is storytelling content and journalistic content are inverted to each other. Oh, right? yeah. Because story, journalistic content uses the, the inverted pyramid style, which is to put the punchline in the headline, put the, make the first sentence the most important, and then make it increasingly less important as you get down. With storytelling, you don't want to have the headline be the butler kills billionaire <laughs> right, because then nobody's going to read beyond the headline. Whereas yeah. when you're storytelling, the emphasis comes later on in the in the, in the story, right? And so you need a mix from an SEO and content perspective of inverted pyramid journalistic style content and storytelling content. And sometimes you have to find that balance between the two, where you have a hook in the beginning, and then that hook was like really strong, but then you have sort of the additional information that sort of supports it, the educational information in, in the article or in the piece. It's the same thing with, with, with the video, right? Yeah. Um, screenwriters, to your point, which is that's, that's brilliant, right? Screenwriters understand that the hero's journey, right? The hero's journey, you don't see that used in SEO very often, right? No. You see it in every screenplay, right? Yeah. I, I, you know, I try to do a little bit of the hero's journey in this podcast when talking with people. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, we're going to go to a break and come back about more about your hero's journey, all right? Sounds good. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC at www.talkradio.nyc. Now broadcasting 24 hours a day. Do you love or are you intrigued about New York City and its neighborhoods? I'm Jeff Goodman, host of Rediscovering New York, a weekly show that showcases New York's history and its extraordinary neighborhoods. Every Tuesday live at 7 p.m., we focus on a particular neighborhood and explore its history, its vibe, its feel, and its energy. Tune in live every Tuesday at 7 p.m. on talkradio.nyc. Hey, all you listeners looking to boost your business why not advertise on talk radio nyc with very reasonable rates interested simply send us a message on our website talkradio.nyc hi 
Hi, I'm Graham Dobbin. Join me every Thursday evening for the Mind Behind Leadership here on talkradio.nyc. We speak to people from business, sport, military and politics, all around what makes a great leader. The personal experiences of what's worked and, maybe more importantly, what hasn't worked. So, that's 7 o'clock every Thursday evening. The Mind Behind Leadership here on talkradio.nyc. Listen to real stories of real leaders. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC. Uplift, educate, empower. This is Joseph McElroy back with uh, Wise Content Creates Wealth and my guest, Kevin Lee. Uh, so Kevin, uh, I'm going back in your past a little bit. I was researching some stuff you wrote on all those articles online. And I found one in 2018 you wrote for, for a search engine lane about branded content, all right? Which is also avatorial content or if it was in, in, in print or infomercials if it was in broadcast. Uh, what I thought was interesting, you compared branded content strategies to the soap opera model of days past. What did you mean by that? And does that still apply today? It, it, it does still apply, right? Um, you know, the, the, the reason branded content is, is hotter than ever uh, now is because ad, ad blockers, right? Um, and the branded content comes in a lot of different flavors, right? Sometimes the branded content that is being created as a result of a request from an agency or a brand, it, it actually mentions the brand, right? And so in that case, it's, it's one flavor of branded content. But an entirely different set of branded content is really sort of the, the understanding that this brand has underwritten a particular piece of content, even though the content doesn't necessarily talk about the brand. Right, so soap operas, you you knew that they were paying for the soap opera for you to be able to watch that soap opera was either Tide or a Unilever product. That's why right. they're called soap operas because soap was allowing you to be entertained by those actors, um, and so they became it became sort of part of the entire uh, the, the entire framework of that that model. Right, was this idea that that was underwritten by somebody. And to be honest, public radio and, and public TV, to a great extent, use a similar model, right? As, as sort of as a pre-roll to your public radio uh, podcast or pre-roll to your uh, Nova on what in New York would be Channel 13, right? You knew that the, you know, Exxon Mobil was the sponsor, right? So that's not straight advertising. That's sort of a branded content. And, and in a digital world, branded content is not typically skippable. And the level of, that you integrate the branded content, it, the brand into the content for branded content is, is a total continuum, right? Because people don't really want to learn about your product necessarily. You may not have an exciting product or you may not have an exciting service, but by dovetailing yourself into the content and making people understand that you, know, you supported that content, that's key. I mean, the entire influencer ecosystem runs on this, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's there's not that much difference between the soap operas and what PewDiePie does, right? He's right. basically integrating that brand into the content. Uh, maybe he mentions what the brand does, maybe he doesn't, but you certainly know that, that your favorite star, whoever that may be, or that, that influencer is being supported by, by that content. So you might think, you know, oh, soap operas, that's like old news. No, they're back. <laughs> <laughs> well, what... Um... What the tips or tools would you uh, do you think help a brand or a research help a brand to determine to what level they should integrate their brand into into some content? You know how 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 does a say a relatively new brand get into this and understand what they should should and shouldn't do? Yeah, I think it it, it really comes down to the the, the marketing strategy, right? As well as sort of what what your product is. Um, some categories, it's tough to create content and integrate your brand into the content 
uh, because the, 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 the topic or the service, if you were to look at it independently, it might seem sort of boring. And some brands have done a really great job with that. And sometimes one brand doing a great job in a category allows everybody else to, in that category to become more creative, right? So I'll use Geico as an example, right? Mm -hmm. Insurance is really not an exciting topic, right? It, it, as far as like just insurance in a box, you know, right, it's insurance, right? Auto insurance, home insurance, whatever. So they have first embraced this idea, like we can tell stories and be funny when we're trying to get our brand across. And then we have other ads, which are pure direct response. Listen, you say 15%, whatever. But they don't exclusively use the gecko. They use the cavemen. They did these Halloween skits that were different. And like the insurance just sort of goes along for the ride, right? And so if you have a somewhat boring type of product or service, you just have to let your, your service and your brand go along for the ride because no one wants to hear about insurance, right? So that um, mayhem to come into existence, right? <laughs> well, but the thing is, it's crazy in that in the in the auto insurance business, right? Progressive and and Liberty Mutual and a bunch of other brands have taken their creative up several notches because yeah. they have to compete against a very creative leader, right? So if if you're if the category you're in is not that exciting, you have to figure out how to story tell within your category and let the story come along for the ride. If you're in a really exciting category. You have you can have a very different strategy, uh, and you can integrate you can integrate into brand placements. Uh, you can even do it in in the way that that is done in movies and TV stations, which is sort of or TV uh, shows, which is brand placement within a movie, right? Uh, M and M's passed on being an ET, so Reese's Pieces got that slot, right? Now that that's you know a part of that movie that was sort of unforgettable, right? Like mm -hmm. ET was eating Reese's Pieces. It could have been eating M&Ms, but no, m and M said, nah, I don't, have, well, I don't really want to be here, right? Now, Reese, I don't know what Reese's Pieces paid. Hershey's, I think, owns Reese's. I don't know what they paid to be in that movie, but I think they got their money's worth, right? So uh, going back to sort of, you know, who's my audience? What are they doing? What content will they engage in? How can I sort of have the, ha have the, the story be authentic and me just be there and, and be... Uh, in the front and center enough to be noticed, but not front and center enough to be annoying, right? Finding that balance where, you know, you're not annoying as a brand, that's, that's when people start to tune you out. That's why people skip commercials in TV and that's why people have ad blockers on turned in their browser, right? So branded content is a way of sort of breaking through that, uh, that influencers are taking advantage of it. You know, when we launch Good Buzz under Giving Forward, we'll have branded content once we get big enough where they'll just sponsor entire channels just like the soap operas did. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a fun way to allow your brand to be relevant um, and it's better than sort of cut and dried advertising in many cases. You know, I met with a, a TV uh, network CMO once and uh, found out that they actually plan months in advance when they're doing uh, something, a show or something to, to, to see what you know, phrases might come out of that. And they actually get optimized for that and also buy, you know, plan ahead to buy campaigns based upon those phrases. Do you think that, you know, uh, integrating SEO into branded content cam campaigns is prevalent or a good idea or, what, you know, have you seen that before? Yeah, I've, I've, I've seen more of the missed opportunities against that than I have the a successful execution of that. Um, I think you have to sort of, I've seen it also tried in the cases of using PPC paid, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in some cases, you sort of have to scratch your head and, and say, well, well, why would they have done that call to action? I, I, think, I think it was a, uh, might have been a, a Toyota ad or one of the major ads in a Super Bowl spot told you to go to Google and look them up, right? And of course, you know, they had their own advertising placed there. So they just cost themselves a whole bunch of money. Was it still worth it? I, I don't know, but um, you know the, the 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 question is whether you'll reach critical mass on those keywords to the point where it makes sense to invest the SEO effort into it, right? Because you're going to have a lag time in the case of SEO. So if you sort of know something's coming out from a branded content perspective, or you have a a placement like Reese's Pieces in a movie, and you know six months ahead of time, you may be able to think about that from an SEO perspective. 
but not just from a straight SEO perspective, think about it from a sort of PR multiplier effect. Like, can you make, make sure that, you know, you're being interviewed about that placement, uh, you know, when that placement hits so that you'll then have the, 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 the reach, the placement power of those brands that interview you, especially if it's like the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, USA Today, et cetera, or, the, you know, a major broadcaster like CNN or Fox News. Yeah, you know, I used to do uh, work with direct response, you know, the, the late night television commercial companies. Uh, and uh, the one, the, one of the reasons they started doing SEO is they were finding their uh, leads, the call lead volume down, right? The calling centers, that the leads were coming in their call centers. It was dropping dramatically. And the reason was, uh, was because people were remembering not the telephone number from the commercial anymore. They were remembering what the commercial, commercial was about. And they would go search that. And competitors would optimize for the content of their commercials. Somebody that was doing a $17 million a year media buy dramatically lost their leads. And another competitor built their whole business and became a huge competitor just by stealing their online leads. You know? So, uh, yeah, in, in those cases, we all, we've also had uh, infomercial, short form infomercial, long form inf infomercial clients. You, you, the other thing that happens is you end up having to double pay because the affiliates do the SEO, right? Yeah. So you could lose it to a competitor. You could end up, you know, double paying in the case of the affiliates who, who are really good at SEO and and essentially think of themselves as publishers as well. So uh, it the, gets complicated. The affiliates now, the, uh, they never prevent you from buying keywords and doing certain things for the brand, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. harder for them to control SEO, obviously. They can stop you from bidding on keywords, but mm -hmm. uh, often affiliates would, would end up outranking uh, outranking the original brand in some keyword searches. <laughs> yeah. Do influencers have to, are you, do you, uh, when you're doing branded content, do you, get influence, do you prevent influencers from doing certain things that might affect uh, SEO or paid uh, search? Um, we haven't gotten into any issues with that yet. We, we, we typically won't let them buy paid search against things uh, just because especially brand related keywords because um, some of the influencer campaigns are, are semi-performance, right? So, so, so they may, it may not be a flat fee. It may be a combination of a flat fee plus a, an affiliate type deal or performance type deal on the back end. So in that case, there are more restrictions, right? If it's a, if it's a performance deal, not just a flat fee. Okay, cool. Well, when we come back, we'll talk a little bit more about the industry um, and uh, look forward to that. Sounds good. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC. Uplift, educate, empower. Are you interested in having a better relationship with yourself, others, and God? Greetings. I'm your host, Dr. George Andow, for the show, A Journey Through Into Awareness. On my show, we journey into the awareness that the mind of God is the true seat of our personal consciousness. We join together each Monday at 7 p.m., so tune in on Talk Radio NYC. You know you have it the potential for a more rewarding life, a life that matters. But how do you get there? The answer is in a best-selling book by the coach of the successful and wealthy, Ken D. Foster. The Courage to Change Everything, Daily Strategies and Wisdom to Awaken Your Hidden Genius and Transform Your Life. With this powerful yet amazingly simple daily guide, your future is in your hands. You will be empowered to unlock your potential, bring out your true gifts, increase your wealth, and take your life and business to a new level. Get your life-transforming copy of Ken D. Foster's The Courage to Change Everything by going to couragetochange.us. That's couragetochange.us. Quite frankly, there's no other book like this. Imagine what your life could be like if you had at your fingertips the success principles to create the life you've always wanted. Are you ready to live your dream? Go to couragetochange.us. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC at www.talkradio.nyc. Now broadcasting 24 hours a day.
Hello, it's Joseph McElroy, back with the Wise Content Creates Wealth podcast with my guest, Kevin Lee. So, uh, Kevin, when we were uh, talking before the show, you mentioned that you, you know some CMOs and marketing VPs underinvest in earned media and SEO because ROI is, is very challenging to predict. So how should the CMOs think about earned media investors, investments to invest at the optimal level? Well, you know, I think um, the, the, the optimal level is going to depend on sort of where they are in their, their journey as a brand and as a domain um, and the attainability of the results that they're trying to accomplish. You know, there are, have been businesses which have sort of still succeeded in spite of a lack of investment in earned media or, or SEO, but they end up uh, being beholden to Google and Facebook and Bing for the rest of their lives, their business lives, right? So the, the, you know, the success within earned media is, is, uh, is an extension of sort of this PR and visibility play. Um, so you have to sort of figure about what, you know, what's the choreography of your, your business launch uh, and when you invest in, in earned media, when you invest in SEO, uh, how would you put KPIs in place that would allow you to sort of know whether or not you're making, you're getting momentum, whether or not you expect to see a return on your investment eventually or not. But, you know, like public relations, right, there are no guarantees, no guarantees in SEO. If somebody gives you a guarantee in SEO, they're probably full of it. So, um, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, right? Same thing with PR, you know, every, every sort of real brand has a PR agency. They may be under investing in the PR agency. That agency may have a $5,000 a month retainer when it should be 15 so that they can do more so that they could expand their breadth and do more outreach to journalists of different types or maybe get into content creation and co-creation. Um, but it, it's, it's a way of providing um, social proof Right, a lot of the stuff that comes out of earned media is sort of social proof. Okay, well, you know, this was on this show, or this was in this newspaper, or this was covered by CNN. You know, I guess it's legit. Now, it could still not be legit, um, just because they got they got coverage. Uh, you know, that doesn't doesn't mean it's legit. And it, it used to be there was a frame the, the saying that there's no such thing as bad PR. Uh, now, I would probably amend that. Like, I guess there is such a thing as bad PR. Just to ask the My Pillow guy. Yes, <laughs> so, uh, you know that the, there is there is such a thing as bad PR, but for the mo most part, if you can if you can associate yourself with good um, good publishing brands, you know, good broadcast brands, good bloggers, good influencers, you know, that's going to sort of float your reputation higher as an organization, and and it'll float your domain's reputation higher as well, right? So coming up with a uh, a set of KPIs, which are leading indicators to the eventual rank that you're trying to achieve, that, that, that I think is key. One thing I like to, to, to advise newer startups is that getting your domain to rank is probably gonna be pretty tough, especially if you're in a competitive category. That doesn't mean you shouldn't invest in SEO, but your SEO strategy is probably gonna be more about controlling the rest of the SERP than it is gonna be about simply your own domain name. And what I mean by that is, Every time you get any kind of a PR hit or even sometimes branded content where you paid for it and it's labeled as advertising, that may still rank. And that's one click away from you, right? So if you can't get your own domain to rank, sometimes you can get your brand a positive mention in a location where they've got a hundred times the ranking power that you do. And you can do that within 48 hours in some cases, right? If you get coverage in a particular broadcast venue or a particular print venue. So you really need to think about how earned media relates to owning the SERP, not just having a rank, right? A lot of SEO folks are really just about, okay, I got my domain, I got, I got my SEMrush, I got my Ahrefs, I got my, all my tools, and I'm just gonna monitor my position for my, my wish list of keywords. Okay, well, that's great. But the reality is not only do you compete with publishers from the perspective of ranking for certain things, right? So to the publishers are your competitors in certain ways, but they're also your allies because you may be able to get content which is sympathetic to your brand to rank in those same publishers, right? Because they've got, they, they're looked upon favorably by the Bing algorithm or the Google algorithm. So that holistic view, I think, is, is much more effective from an earned media investment perspective than a, a narrow focused siloed SEO view. 
And I don't know if you agree with me on that or not. <laughs> no, no. I, you know, I, I, we, we, we talk about a, you know, content hub, and it's not just a topical hub like a lot of people think. It's a content hub that encompasses not just your site, but the whole, everything re related to that topic that is important to you outside. And how, how can you can have co-creators, influencers, and publications, everything to be part of your, your uh, ecosystem for that particular topic. So, you know, it's, uh, it's important to think holistically about that because all that contributes to your, your traffic, whether it's to your site or to your telephone call or to your, your subscription or where, whatever, you know, or even to just your brand awareness, right? Yep. So, uh, uh, no, I agree with that 100. It's much more of a, um, a holistic enterprise. Yeah. But that being said, <laughs> do you think that the SEO process itself is being undervalued by marketing departments. Oh yeah, and and usually it comes back to bite them in the ass uh, after uh, underinvestment of several years. Um, it's not unusual for a major brand to sort of have a wake up call, where they get either disintermediated by a publisher or a competitor comes on the market and invests heavily, and you know they have this weird. It happens with big brands in particular, like we deserve to rank because we're big, old, and the best, right? Yeah. Well, they may be big and they may be old as to whether they're the best or not. Okay, well, the Google algorithm is gonna decide whether they are worthy of ranking. And if a competitor is, is investing two, three X what you're investing in SEO and you're not matching it, they will catch up and they will pass you. And you won't notice that they passed you until they're a mile ahead of you in the marathon. So if somebody passes you and you don't notice they passed you till, they pa till they're a mile ahead of you in the New York Marathon, you're gonna have to run really fast to catch up. And that's where it really hits the CFO's you know, uh, radar is because when the SEO team says, well, we've underinvested in SEO for seven years and it's gonna require uh, you know, a million plus investment for us to catch up, can we have a million dollars? Usually that is a tough sell. But, um, you know, so, so trying to figure out how to then catch up in such a way or, or, or invest the max that the CFO or CMO will allocate, right, and still manage to catch up against this fast moving competitor. It, that's key, right? So you need a really strategic SEO firm or, or SEO firm that also understands PR and social media and, and all those things to help you take whatever budget you have, regardless of whether it's enough or not, and do the most you can with it. Yeah, I, you know, uh, I see so many companies, especially in, um, you know, store chains, right, uh, that just have not invested in, say, they have multiple locations all over the place, and they put up a little store locator, and in the free store, you get a little, a little address, and that's it, and that's just like throwing away the, the local search, which is like, what, 70, 80, 70 percent of search, and people, 90 percent of people have a buy intent when they do it, Whatever those numbers are, and, and they're just throwing that away. And you know, the, you know, I looked at Sir Pablo, which went out of business, you know, got went bankrupt since a couple of years ago, and they do local classes, local this, local this, and they did nothing for their local, you know, tables. And everybody's when you search for stuff like a local cooking class, they were nowhere there. And I'm saying this is real trouble for them. And lo and behold, you know, the, 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 they couldn't keep the business up. And you know, local is big right now. So, you know, it's, they totally undervalued the whole SEO effort on that. And, you know, and, and sometimes it gets me very upset. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, but we're, we're both, both very passionate about SEO and, and earned media and content in particular. And, um, you know, when, when we see it underinvested, um, you know, getting that, you know, finding a way to convince the, the holders of the money to sort of part with that money to invest, it requires sometimes some pretty innovative strategies, right? Because um, they're like, yeah, but I, why don't I just put more money into AdWords? Well, maybe that should, money should go into AdWords, but you should have another separate budget that goes into SEO. Because um, the longer you underinvest, the more trouble you're in. Now, you may think I'm not going to have this job by the time it hits the fan, but you know that's really not a good, good <laughs> brand steward, right? Yeah. To basically say it's not going to be my problem in three years. You should try to think three years out. Yeah, and you might be the CEO, and then you, then you got to get your uh, yeah, exactly your bottom line in shape. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so um, 
So how, in your experience, how should a company uh, approach the SERP, which I, I want to let or some of our listeners know means search engine result page, all right? Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, like it, the, the holistic view of approaching the SERP is key, right? And and, and in, in particular, understanding this, this idea that uh, sometimes Google will impute local intent, even if it's not stated, right? And sometimes Google will impute the fact that perhaps news results belong here, even though it's not stated, or social media results, even though it's not stated. So you know, you, you can't look at it too myopically. You have to say basically, well, or sometimes video, right? That, that there's another key one. The second largest search engine in the world is YouTube, right? So mm -hmm. if you don't have a video SEO strategy, you just ignore the second largest search engine in the world. So um, you, you need to really think about that, that Google SERP and the way it's dynamic, right? Because they may integrate product, news, social, video, um, into into their into a search where that was just an imputed uh, uh, step by Google. You didn't say near me, right? But you said exterminator, right? Well, I don't really want to have a, an exterminator listing from La Jolla, California. That's not useful to me, right? So of course right. the the local intent is imputed. So Google will absolutely show it. So if you're not as a as a as a marketer thinking about that and thinking about well, wait a minute, maybe my video on how to use borax or whatever to, to, to get rid of something, right? Maybe that should rank in, in video, right? And, and maybe there's something that's newsworthy. Uh, so you really have, this, I can't, we keep coming back to this holistic view, right? This holistic view of the SERP, this holistic view of content creation and, and doing journalistic style content, doing video style content, doing infographics, doing um, storytelling, it all belongs in the mix. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I just recently had a, a construction client doing good construction. And, you know, we went in thinking it was one type of content. And then we found out that share of voice, 60% of it went to video. All right. Uh, and very few people looked at the content. It was all video content. So right. anyway, uh, we'll come back, talk a little bit more about what you're doing. And, uh, uh, and then we'll be closing up. All right. Sounds good. You're listening to... Talk Radio NYC. Uplift, educate, empower. Are you a small business trying to navigate the COVID-19 related employment laws? Hello, I'm Eric Sarman, employment law business law attorney and host of the new radio show, Employment Law Today. On my show, we'll have guests to discuss the common employment law challenges business owners are facing during these trying times. Tune in on Tuesday evenings from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern Time on talkradio.nyc. Are you a business owner? Do you want to be a business owner? Do you work with business owners? Hi, I'm Stephen Fry, your small and medium-sized business or SMB guy, and I'm the host of the new show, Always Friday. While I love to have fun on my show, we take those Friday feelings of freedom and clarity to discuss popular topics on the minds of SMBs today. Please join me and my various special guests on Friday at 11 a.m. on talkradio.nyc. Do you run or are ready to open your own business? Hi, I'm Jeremiah Fox. I've been operating and opening small business for the last 25 years, and I'm the host of the new show, The Entrepreneurial Web. Tune in every Friday at noon Eastern time for insights and stories on the nuances of running small business right here on Fridays at noon, talkradio.nyc. <laughs> You're listening to Talk Radio NYC at www.talkradio.nyc. Now broadcasting 24 hours a day. Well, this is Joseph Franklin McElroy back with uh, Wise Content Creates Wealth uh, podcast with my guest, Kevin Lee. So, Kevin, a quick question. 
Is uh, schema going to be big in 2021? <laughs> I guess every year is the year of mobile and every year is the year of schema. You know, I, I, I'm not sure that schema always, it, schema forces you to think in a certain way that I think uh, is useful, right? Whether or not it ends up being a dynamic ranking factor to be a tiebreaker, right? So much of SEO these days is tiebreaking, right? So whether or not schema versus no schema will be a tiebreaker in the case where you've got great content and you've got great inbound links and everything else is equal, will schema be the tiebreaker? I'm not sure, right? You know, especially as rank brain starts to kick in at Google and some of the more sophisticated AI based algorithms, I'm not sure that schema will necessarily be the tiebreaker, but I think it, it helps inform Google and Bing for that matter, right? About sort of your content and where your content fits into the broader ecosystem. I think they were smart in not giving it too much weight because you and I go far back far enough where meta keywords were abused, right? Yeah. So Google cannot allow schema to be abused, but that doesn't mean that they'll completely ignore it, right? And so they have to find as engineers this balance between not ignoring it because it's useful, right? But not allowing it to be a way of manipulating things the way that, that meta keywords and, and meta titles were in the past, but in particular meta keywords. So um, I, I, think they, they, I think it's worth going through the mental exercise of, of adding schema to your site if schema should be there, right? Whether it's local schema or what, what, any one of the schemas, right? It's worth going through the mental exercise because it, it helps you categorize your content. It helps you categorize your business and it, it, and it informs your content creation strategy. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's gonna be the year of schema from a ranking strategy perspective, but I think it adds a framework to your content planning strategy. At least that's how we think of it. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I think that you're exactly right on the, the ranking. I do think it can be useful in formatting your, your search result, especially things like the FAQ schema. And I don't know how long they allow you, but, but each of the answers you can put a link into something else. So you could uh, actually do a whole direct response campaign in FAQ, right? right. But, uh, you know, that, that I, don't, I don't see a lot of people taking advantage of that yet. Um, but uh, so um, let's move on to you. I also, you, throughout your career, you've also had um, a real concern for social, uh, social you know, causes, right? Um, and there's, of course, there's an interesting story that you were involved with at, you know, at the end of it. And I'd love for you to tell the, a little bit of the story of Gawker and then how you got involved with that Gawker story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, cause marketing is my favorite form of philanthropy because you're basically taking marketing dollars, either people's behavior or attention, and you're turning them into money, turning that into money for nonprofits. And so, you know, b before I even had this crazy idea to buy Gawker, I had started We Care, which was cause marketing powered commerce. And after six and a half years, Amazon, our biggest partner, decided to have us do an A-B split test. We proved lift and conversion rate, lift and shopping cart size. They terminated our agreement and they launched Smile. So, you know, we plateaued at 8.3 million donated to causes with WeCare. And then Amazon's now at about 140 million donated with, with Smile. And <clears throat> I take karma credit for that to some extent. <laughs> um, but after that, I got obsessed with this idea of content. Right, and, and, and you and I both love content, but it was the idea of cause marketing powered content. Like if I could get my content donated for free instead of having to pay an author to do it, and it was great content, then I could probably afford to give half of the ad revenue to nonprofits. So I built a platform where we would let the reader pick and let the content creator pick a cause. And we would measure it like Google Analytics basically. And we would then at the end of the month be able to distribute ad revenue. The problem was I had no ad revenue because I had no domains. So I started looking for stuff to buy and I was the only bidder on uh, Gothamist and all the other is Chicagoist, LAist, SFist and DNA Info when Joe Ricketts shut that down. And then at the last minute, WNYC bought it with a million bucks from an uh, anonymous philanthropist. I think it was Bloomberg. Uh, and so I started looking for something else to buy. Uh, it wasn't worth a million to me. So I found out about the Gawker bankruptcy. It was two years after they sold everything else to Univision. And I said, you know, Gawker's got amazing SEO. I think it was 12.6 inb million inbound links, right? And to the extent that those would still remain valid, that would be a great running start for a content play. 
Um, and if I could get Hollywood celebrities to participate and, and donate content into Gawker, that'd be cool. So I tried to buy Gawker, turn it into Gawker for good. Uh, I was the high bidder for six months. And uh, then when Peter Thiel agreed not to litigate the buyer, uh, they ran a second auction because they wanted to run a second auction because Peter Thiel had, had scared everybody away with an announcement that he was gonna sue whoever bought it out of existence. I didn't care about the archives as much, so I would have taken them down if that had become an issue, but other buyers potentially really wanted the archives. So I didn't get Gawker, I didn't get uh, Gothamist. I tried to buy Lenny Letter from Lena Dunham and Jenny Connor. I tried to buy Rookie Mag from Tammy Jevonson. Couldn't get any of those deals done. And so I started giving forward a nonprofit and we're launching goodbuzz.org now. Um, the inspiration for that is basically uh, John Krasinski. If you've seen his Some Good News show. Oh, that, that's a good, that's a good yeah. show, yeah. I mean, you know, I said, if I can create like 50 John Krasinski's talking about fun stuff and doing interviews with each other, uh, that would be a lot of fun. And then we could let them pick nonprofits. Each of the stars could pick a nonprofit and we would take 25% of the ad revenue would go there. 25% would go to the viewer's choice in the case of video. So that's been built and it's up, get up ready to launch on goodbuzz.org. Um, we did a partnership with the Miss America organization where we'll have both Miss America and Miss Teen America interviewing celebs starting next week, actually. Um, and uh, so if anyone has celebrities and they want to get them interviewed or they, they want to get their celebrities up on Good Buzz, we want to reach that point where we're where the publicists are saying, okay, we're doing this on Twitter, this on Facebook, this on Instagram, this on TikTok, and we're donating this to Good Buzz. If we can reach that point where it becomes a hub for a lot of great content generated by sports, music, and Hollywood celebs, as well as influencers, we could get pretty big and I'd love that money to go to causes. Uh, it would just make such a huge difference. As you know, that the, the, digital, the digital pot of money it's $350 billion is going to be this year, right? $350 billion is a big number. It's a B. Um, Instagram is going to do at least $30 billion by itself. I don't think we're going to get to Instagram size, but we can make it, you know, we can make a small dent if we get big and, and you know, start distributing millions of dollars to nonprofits. So I'm pretty passionate about that. It's a hobby of mine. Uh, I hired a general manager to run it recently. So uh, we'll see where it goes. Uh, goodbuzz.org. <laughs> Good buzz, better. And, you, and uh, what, what would uh, people be able to, uh, besides giving you content, any other way people can help you? Uh, I mean, I've got all sorts of stuff I have the volunteers working on. Um, you know, we, we've also got an events division for that, uh, where we allow, allow the buyers of the tickets to basically choose a nonprofit when they buy the ticket. So again, it democratizes where the money goes. Um, we've got volunteers uh, helping us with research, with, with content co-creation, uh, with, with marketing, uh, with social media. Uh, could always use some extra extra eyeballs, extra brain be, cells. It would be a really great way for a young person to learn a lot about content, wouldn't it? I, I think, you know, it, it, everything, you know, anything marketing related, right? I got, yeah. I've got, I got to launch my ad, my AdWords ad grant, right? Because I haven't got a chance to do that yet. So we've got, we've got um, people who could get their hands dirty in a whole bunch of different categories from, you know, journalism, PR, um, you know, biz dev, uh, once we get big, we'll start selling branded content, uh, a nonprofit liaison. We're going to be working really tightly with nonprofits, um, uh, a Hollywood liaison, right? Working with publicists and, and brands. So um, I'm pretty optimistic about it, uh, obviously, uh, pretty passionate about it. Um, did it pay the bills and it's still growing? We're, we're doing great. I've got an amazing team, still takes the first 48, 45 hours of my week. Um, and then uh, giving forward and good buzz, uh, take the rest. My family gets a little bit of time too. So, well, thank you very much. And thank you very much for being a guest on the show. Uh, I think everybody can go to didit.com to get a hold of you, right? Uh, uh, or LinkedIn, find my LinkedIn profile. Uh, happy to chat via LinkedIn. Uh, pretty easy to find. Cool. And then you can uh, find me, at Joseph. You can send me an email, Joseph at Galileo Tech Media.com. As I mentioned before, Galileo Tech Media is a specializes in wise content for SEO, social media, podcasts, uh, and, and different kinds of uh, campaigns that you might want to be involved with. Uh, we did 40,000 pieces of content for Marriott at one point in 2019. So uh, we're, in this, uh, we're in this to win it. Um, and you can, this, this uh, Wise Content Creates Wealth uh, is part of the Talk Radio.NYC network. There's some pretty good other shows on here. Please check it out. 
And um, I, um, I, I, I'm building a site called the Wise Content Creates Wealth.com where you'll be able to find information about the show. Um, and right now you can go to facebook.com slash wise wealth creates content to find uh, copies of the previous podcast and any kind of events or things that we're uh, putting on. So it's been nice talking to you all and uh, see you next week. We're at Keith Reynolds talking about uh, publishing hubs. Thank you so much, Joe.